enjoy your webinar. Michael, I hand over to you now. Thanks, Anna. Um, yeah, so what, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about something a little bit different. So those of you who have been involved in the webinars last year, you'll have remembered that we talked a lot about language training, particularly uh, VILT or Zoom-based or online training. But this time, we're looking at something different. We're going to look at aeronautical communication. And in this case, not just language proficiency, but all the elements that factor into how the, the things that affect the communication. So we've got language proficiency, something here we're calling situational demands. They're the th sort of things that shape how the communication will unfold that are perhaps outside the control of either the pilot or the controller. Things that you can see there are some examples. We've also got, of course, operational knowledge or technical knowledge. That's the things that relate to their background training and their experience. These things, of course, affect how they interact and communicate. Really importantly here, we've got communication skills, uh, the awareness of the other person, their engagement skills, and something we would call in linguistics, strategic competence, things like how they might accommodate the other speaker and adapt their language. We've also got here something where we can call culture, which some of you have been to our face-to-face face -to -face conferences. You would have seen us talk about this before, but things about how our cultural backgrounds might inter inter interact with our communication and affect and shape how the communication unfolds. And the last one we've got here, of course, is local work practices, company policies, company procedures, both from the airline and the AT ANSP, how they might affect how the individual participates in the communication. So if we put all those things together, there's probably many more, of course, that we could, we could add to this, but all these that we're gonna talk about today are factors that affect the aeronautical communication, in particular, radio communication, radio telephony communication. So what we're gonna to do today is we've got, uh, we've organized two case studies. So the panel, as you know, we've, we've got six people on the panel, three controllers, three pilots. What we're gonna do is uh, first introduce a little bit about their background, uh, we've done that, then talk a little bit about their experiences and their ideas about this. Neil and I will be asking questions during the interview panel. Then we're gonna start with two case studies, uh, which some of you may be familiar with, the recordings. We'll play the recordings and show the, the transcripts on the screen. And then we're gonna discuss with the panel their, their views about this. So we've got an hour and a half to do this, maybe a little bit more, see how we go. Um, yep, yeah, so let's, let's start, thank you. So again, welcome uh, the panel. We're, we're really privileged to have such an experienced team here. But we're gonna start with a nice simple question, which remembering that, that previous slide about um, the, the, if the factors affecting communication, um, just asking the panel in general, um, maybe starting with, with Anya, who is a very experienced uh, pilot from the Netherlands. Can you tell us any things from your background where you think effective communication between pilots and controllers may facilitate the communication. What kind of things do you think help the communication move along? Starting with Anya. Uh, so hi everyone. Um, so for my personal experience, I think for the purpose tonight, I would like to distinguish between an emergency call and, and standard communication. So my answer right now, I just focus on day-to-day -day operation and standard communication that we do. Uh, what facilitates things, so when I came to Asia, uh, we have many language, uh, many uh, accents to deal with. And uh, so I think local knowledge helped me a lot. Uh, getting familiar with what to expect from a clearance or uh, why certain clearances won't be available. Getting used to an accent when you go through um, different locations in Asia. 
so you can talk to colleagues who are from there, um, that, that sort of thing. So trying to brief yourself as much as possible of um, local procedures. Okay, thanks, Senia. And Sebastian, a controller from, from Romania, have you got anything to, that you would add to that or maybe a little bit different? Uh, I agree with what uh, Anya said before. Uh, I can't come up with uh, anything else to say about uh, communication. I think it depends on many factors. Of course, uh, your equipment might uh, be of uh, a certain degree, it can uh, affect your work, but uh, it's, uh, it also depends on uh, the different uh, places the pilots come from and how sure. they maybe formulate some sentences and how they uh, use their normal language and try to translate that in their mind before saying it on the frequency. Okay, um, thanks. We'll, 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 we'll come back to the rest of the panel for, for more of these, <laughs> this, this pretty sure. big topic actually. So I'm gonna pass over to Neil. Thanks, Michael. Um, <clears throat> I think it was interesting what you know, the, the little bit of excerpts we had there from both Anya and Sebastian. Um, my question really is, is a little bit broader and I'd like to address this to, to Lance, first of all. Um, and what I'd like to know about is, do you have any actual experience of communicating um, as a pilot with controllers, maybe with, with, with other pilots, um, where different cultures has affected the communication? Now that could be cultures as in uh, between different countries, different regions, or it could be between different airlines, uh, working with somebody from another airline, for example. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, many experiences actually. And um, I, I think that there are challenges wherever you happen to be working in the world, whether it's uh, in Asia, North America, Europe, there are different, different challenges associated with every region. Um, one example I would give is, uh, a destination that I fly to quite regularly in uh, Asia. Um, part of the challenges there are that the, the communication is very fast from air traffic control. So they speak very, very quickly, giving multiple instructions at the same time, which is very difficult to process in one go. Um, and it actually takes quite a lot of your capacity to understand and to be very clear about what they're um, asking you to do or what they're requesting. Um, so you really have to uh, make a conscious effort to slow things down and to make them understand perhaps what challenges you're facing. Um, uh, checking understanding is very, very important. Checking that they understand uh, what your requirements are. And conversely, checking that what your understanding of their requirements are is also very clear. So in my experience, in, in situations like that, which is very common, actually, not just in Asia, but certainly in North America, where air traffic control, the pace of it, the speed is very, very fast, um, is very important. You have to really, at times, kind of lead the, uh, the discussion and just slow things down and really clarify uh, the instructions that are being communicated to, uh, backwards and forwards. Mm. Okay, thanks Lance. I'd like to bring in Alicia now to see the, the, the ATC side of it. I mean, you've heard you know, the pilot side of it there, quite a lot of very, very um, key elements, key components about listening understanding, trying to understand what the other person is thinking about. Alessia, from your side, and any experiences that, that kind of match what Lance was saying there? Oh, well, yeah. Uh, I, I had two really scary experiences where communication was a factor. Uh, first, well, uh, once I was working in, in the terminal area, which is uh, like a tracon, and uh, I had uh, two aircraft coming together, one above the other. Um, as I had to space them, um, I turned the one that was in the lower level to take it to the uh, localizer uh, to make a space for the other to get behind. And I told the first one that 
to turn and to descend. And they, they had very similar call signs. They, they were called Varic 90110 and Varic 90410. And <laughs> I, I gave the instruction to the, the one that was in the lower level that was a Varic 90010, turn right heading 270 and descend. And then um, the pilot read back uh, correctly. And the other one was the one executing the instruction. And that was very scary. So I had to uh, act uh, very quickly and uh, stop uh, or, or tell him to stop. And when I talked to the pilot, he said that he knew that the instruction was not for him. But he did it because mm -hmm. uh, the expectation bias that he had that he was waiting for the descent and he was waiting for an instruction to go on the on the approach. And luckily nothing happened, but it was scary. And that uh, gave me uh, the experience to speak very clearly to warn the other pilot that there's somebody with a similar call sign on the frequency and, and to be careful at, about that. And I mm -hmm. guess that's a key to, for communication, huh? uh, to warn the other, to talk to the pilot and take your time and uh, learn to listen, not only what they say, but the silences uh, to see when they didn't understand anything Mm -hmm. uh, because, um, uh, and take your time, as Lance said, uh, when you speak so uh, too quickly, the, the other person is not going to be able to, to pick up everything that you say. Sure. Um, there was a research, a very interesting research of the Federal Aviation Administration that they say that when you say more than three pieces of information in a communication, you will surely have to uh, say again or to check the information because uh, it's only three pieces that you can pick up at a time. Sure, oh. sure, sure. Thanks, Alicia. I'll, I'll just jump in there and, and stop you there because what we'd like to do is now move on to the first um, scenario which we're going to play. As Michael mentioned earlier, we've got two scenarios. And um, Anna, if you could move on to the, the next slide for us. Thank you. Um, so the first scenario is um, a situation encountered by a Swiss Airbus uh, taking off from St. Petersburg in um, 2013. Um, bird strike, multiple bird strike affecting both engines on departure. And you'll hear now the, um, some of the pilot ATC communication. And it's on the screen for you uh, to read through as we listen to it. And then we'll throw some more questions at the panel based on this individual um, situation that you're going to hear now. As I said, it's not the whole dialogue. We've obviously, it's, a, it's, it's quite a long dialogue and we've picked out certain elements which we think are relevant to um, this webinar today. And certainly what the panel members have already brought up has, um, has highlighted some of these issues. So if you just listen and read the screen and then we'll come back to the panel when it's finished. Three, one, one, mayday, mayday, mayday. Bird strike climbing to 900 meters height. Proceeding straight ahead. Mayday, uh, uh, would you like uh, on the one that I left? Fire on the two eight right. Proceeding straight ahead, request straight away. Two one one zero. Wings one three one one. And it is high. Uh, what kind of uh, problem? Okay. Climbing to 3,100 and request straight of access. Take the heading. Swiss 1311, turn left, climbing to 110. Left heading uh, 100, Swiss 31311. Swiss 1311, what is the problem? Take it, Swiss 1311. Swiss 1311, what is your problem, uh, my day? Bird strike, bird strike. Uh, 
Chris Van Brie Van Ram, Jerkic, Request 10 miles final, Chris Van Brie Van Ram. Chris Van Brie Van Ram, expect. Strike dirt, film, Chris Van Brie Van Ram. Again. Switch one three one one. You catch that. Again. What the situation? Switch one three one one. High vibration. One and two engines. Two engines. Switch one three one one because catch that. Ground to low, Swiss 1311, we have stopped at the intersection, both engines are shut down, we would like to have the fire brigade to inspect for any smoke or fire. Swiss 1311, to the ground. Hello. Uh, pass your message. Swiss 1311. Uh, 1311, to the ground. Go ahead, uh, Swiss uh, 1311. Swiss 1311, pass your message, please. Please say again. S1311, full to the ground, wait on uh, taxiway Bravo 4. Okay, we wait, we have shut down all engines, we cannot move, we cannot move, we need a tractor, we need a tractor. S1311, what's the car? Uh, 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 specify what uh, engine uh, builds like. Both engines, engine one, engine two, we had problems. Now we shut down the engines and the fire brigade should just look whether there is a smoke. Please one, three, one, one, do you uh, need to disembark passengers? No, I need a tractor. This is uh, one, three, one, one, tractor sent for you. Okay, so I think you probably agree there's quite a lot of individual elements of the of communication there. The aircraft finally landed and, and, and everybody was safe. Um, but I'd like to address the first question to Aline. Um, and that simple question is, Aline, how effective would you say this communication is, both between the pilot and the departure controller, and then between the, uh, the, the pilot or the pilots, you could hear both of them there, and the ones on the ground? It's really poor communication, of course, on, on both sides mm -hmm. and on both frequencies. Uh, I mean, the simple message of birth strike didn't pass in the first place. Uh, the heading was not understood because it wasn't told correctly. It wasn't the specific heading, 110, was read back wrong and not corrected. Um, I think, I mean, from the from the uh, departure controller, I think there was an obvious lack of uh, understanding of uh, the situation. Uh, anybody in the aviation would have to understand bird strike. I mean, it's, it's such a simple and obvious one. Um, and then, of course, Swiss is under stress. It's, it's an emergency situation. We don't know what's going on in the cockpit. So it's certainly, the pilots are certainly, uh, I imagine, busy with understanding their own problem without having too much uh, time to deal with the controller. And then when they pass onto ground, there is a lot of gobbling, noise disturbances. It sounds like they're I don't know, are they in the cafeteria or are there lots of people about? It's, it's really, uh, I mean, I don't understand how a pilot could manage to, would manage to, to carry on a conversation like that. Luckily he's on the ground, so the stress level is certainly lower. Uh, so there isn't a life threat uh, right there. But I mean, this kind of situation for me uh, could not be allowed to happen personally. Um, and uh, um, if I go back to one of the questions earlier on that uh, Neil asked, it, the limitations in speaking English. I mean, we decided that English is a common language so we can all speak together. 
but it needs to have a certain standard because otherwise it's just an hindrance. Um, and you know, once you're on the ground, it's probably not a big deal, but when you're in the air with an emergency and with that kind of understanding, I should imagine that the Swiss pilot wasn't feeling very reassured. That's pretty much what I, what I, um, I have in mind. And also maybe another thing as a controller, we're always being told, you know, you stay calm. The stress is for the pilot. You stay calm and reassured that you have the situation under control on your side. Uh, I wasn't feeling very reassured hearing this controller, to be honest. And another controller stepped in. I think there were two different controllers on the departure which uh, might be a bit confusing uh, one for the ones that are up in, in the air. I think so, maybe on the ground as well, it sounded like maybe the, the female controller sounded maybe like a trainee. It was, we're not clear on that, but somebody kind of stepped in there as well. Um, so again, you know, two people speaking to, to the pilot. Um, thanks, Ali. I'm gonna um, hand everybody back to Michael now to, to continue the, the questions now about the- yeah, uh, Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Neil and Aline. Um, Maybe just put this question to both both Lance and Gabriel, both maybe starting with Lance. What, what do you think, other than just the, as Aileen mentioned, the, the language proficiency, do you think there are any other factors that cause communication problems here? Any other factors besides the language proficiency? Well, I think uh, as Aline touched on uh, or mentioned very clearly, actually incorrectly, that it was clearly a very uh, a very high workload situation for the pilots, and they really uh, they really needed as little distraction as possible. And I think as Anya also touched on earlier, the the dynamic between pilot and controller is very different between a, a, a normal situation and an abnormal or emergency situation where very much the controller should let the pilot lead the communication. So in this case, really what was happening is on, in the air at least, the, the controller was providing unnecessary distraction to the Swiss pilots, which I think in general, the Swiss pilots, from what we heard, managed it quite well. They managed to stay quite calm, but there was some confusion over headings. Um, and, and certainly the, the, uh, the continuing questioning from ATC regarding the nature of the problem wasn't, wasn't very helpful to say the least. I think what, no, why, what why Swiss think, Yeah, Lance, why sorry, do you think, yeah. sorry, just why do you think the controller in particular kept asking those questions? What, what, what do you think is the reason? Well, I, I think mean, maybe language. What, uh, I think in this case, it, it, there, there, was, there was a language issue for sure. <laughs> I mean, there's no doubt about that. Um, but that, that is very often the case globally. Um, that, 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 that's not very unusual, to be honest, even, even today. But I think, as we'll see when we look at the scenario in Singapore, there is an element of, uh, you know, the, the, the air traffic controllers do need to have a certain level of understanding of what's going on so they can make their preparations so they can prioritize correctly and they can they can you know take the correct action and guide the pilot in the right way so i i think maybe if i'm being kind to atc they were trying to get as much information as they could so they could help the pilot but unfortunately they didn't really know when to step back or maybe the language issue was just too much for them they couldn't step back and give the crew the time and space to, to manage the situation. Okay, thanks. And, and Gabriel, <laughs> um, anything you'd like to add to that, Gabriel, from the yeah, pilot's point of view? Uh, yeah. yeah, just reinforcing what Lance told, in this situation, it's a very stressful situation. We can see more clearly this particular situation in that movie with Captain Sullivan in the Hudson. It's almost the same thing, but more serious. Uh, the, in this case, the pilot must lead the situation. And the ATC just have to answer the question the pilot is making, not what this guy, what this controller was doing and using not a standard phraseology like catch a bird, catch a bird. It was easy to say bird strike, it, to have a bird strike. I don't know if the ATC has some paperwork to fill in this situation. 
he was really concentrated in knowing what was what was the problem and not trying to help the pilot. I don't know what happened there, but I, I think this is my point of view. In this case of situation, the, the controller must just stay quiet and just answer the questions of what the pilot is demanding, what he's asking to. Okay. All right, thanks. I think Gabriel, there was an interesting point there, which you mentioned about when uh, we talked about, you know, you catch bird. And this is something we discussed last, last week when we were doing the preparation. Um, the controller said, strike bird, a firm Swiss 1311. And then the pilot said, say again. And he, that's what he tried yeah. to paraphrase. He tried to say, you catch bird. Obviously, as Lance said, there's, there's a bit of language missing there. And he's trying to use these strategic skills. But even that RT stand it, say again, was not really clear. And we discussed this last week. Does it mean just repeat something? Or does it mean, um, you know, I, I, I didn't understand what you mean, but would you paraphrase or something like that? So there's lots of different levels of, of communication going on there. So I think really, really important key elements brought up there, both by Lance and Gabriel. Yeah. I'd like to bring in Sebastian here. Um, I think it's interesting that we had two different um, parts of the two different phases of flight, one in flight, one on the, once on the ground. How would you say the communication problems differ on the ground from those in the air, uh, Sebastian? Well, as mentioned before, when the aircraft's in there, uh, it's a lot more time critical. You need to get that air aircraft down safely. In this particular situation, after the aircraft had landed, it was very clear that he needed a tractor to be pulled. I understand it's still an emergency situation, but it's not as time critical. Uh, as it was pointed out before, I would also like to uh, say this again. Uh, the, I heard in the departure part where the aircraft was talking to departure, two mm -hmm. different ATCs on the same operational frequency. I'm not sure what was going on there. Uh, sometimes in uh, high and stressful situations or emergency situations, you may have another colleague come sit next to you and help you deal with all the information. You might be able to get the information from the aircraft and uh, you have one or two colleagues help pass that information along. Also in this particular case, I'm not really sure how the departure was transmitting information towards the tower and how effective that was. It didn't seem very effective to me. Okay, thanks, Sebastian. Um, we're gonna to have to move on for time-wise now. We're just being our timekeepers uh, <laughs> pushing us along here. Um, so we'll go back to Michael this time and we'll bring in the second scenario. Okay, and I'll leave Michael to run you through that one. Sure, thanks, Neil. So in this second situation, if Anna, if we can move across one, one slide. Calling Anna. Yeah, I'm here, just trying to, yeah. Okay, sure, no worries. Okay, so this, this, this is a slightly different case, case study two here. You know, you remember in that, that first case, we had a Swiss, a competent Swiss, uh, flight crew and maybe less competent in terms of proficiency uh, controllers. This case is a little bit different. This is in Singapore, it happened in 2015. Uh, it's, it's a low cost airline. It's a, one of the crew members is, is German and the other one is uh, a very competent English speaker of German, uh, German English speaker. And the other one is a, singer, a native Singaporean um, as his co-pilot. Now, in this case, two things happen. The aircraft's just taken out of taken off out of uh, Changi, Singapore's international airport, and on climb, there's the, the, the engine cowling comes off the aircraft. It becomes detached. Now, this is quite a long uh, situation, and it originally was about forty minutes. It's been edited down to be quite short for us for the purposes of the webinar. Um, and the, the second part is because of the engine cowling come off, it has come off. In fact, what it, it disrupted a part, part of the avionics and caused a gear unsafe indication in the flight deck. Now, in fact, the gear was okay, but the pilots 
we're not sure about this. So later in, in the second part of the recording, there's a gear unsafe indication. So the pilot's got two issues to contend with. And what we're gonna to listen to is how the, the controllers deal with this situation. In particular, I think we're gonna focus maybe not so much on the language proficiency, although it's still in the background there, but other things that you remember from that, that very first slide. So let's listen. And as we had for case study one, we'll track the, the listening, the recording with the transcript for you. Sorry, just a second. Just click on play, Anna, on the, the left there. On the left, keep going, keep going. No, no. Keep. Yeah, just a second, it's because of the bar here, it's not helping me. Keep the cursor on the bar, Anna, and just slide it along to the left. No, the bar, I mean, the, the bar from Zoom. <laughs> ah, okay, sorry, okay. Sorry guys, just a second, bear with me. Maybe if you close- How can the... I remove this, this bar from Zoom from- uh, Maybe if you close the presentation mode, Anna, so it shrinks the, um, shrinks the PowerPoint. Okay. But then it's, it's too, okay. Departure, good evening, go catch 263. If it's out of the presentation mode, you won't be able to read it, will you? It's very small, yeah. You did, can you move your, oh, I was gonna say if you. Yeah, Anna, just maybe yeah. just make me host for a second. Or I'll, I'll share my screen, okay? All right. Let me see if I can help you. Hang on a sec. Or do you want, I, I can just play the audio if you want, Michael. Yeah, if you've got it, sure, go ahead. Yeah. Michael, you're the host now. Okay, thanks, Anna. Go ahead, Neil. Yeah. Departure, good evening. Go catch 263. I don't suppose we are. Well, passing my country, climbing 3,000. Go get to six three, departure identify, climb to six thousand feet. Climb six thousand feet, go get to six three. Request uh, to hold the technical. And uh, advise nature of technical to enable. Uh, stand by, radar. We have to be kept to things. Go get to six three, uh, request for holding button. Okay, uh, initially heading two seven zero and uh, give me advice. And go get to six three. Uh, they were entering a hole at a certain station and we advise uh, we need to return to Singapore. Good we'll advice on the technical. Okay, copy that. We'll inform the power. Uh, let me know the nature of the issue uh, ASAP. Go get to six three. Uh, do you require downfield? And I'll go get to six three. Uh, do you require downfield for go get to six three? Uh, stand by. Go get to six three. Uh, we yeah, advise the passengers have reported that our left hand engine housing has uh, come off. Left hand engine housing has come off. C O W L I N G. Uh, left hand bowling has come off. Cowling, Charlie, Osa, Whiskey, Lima, India, whatever, so. Uh, Cowling, copy. Uh, go get 263. I need to uh, double check. Is uh, some passenger informed that the left hand engine? Uh, Cowling has came off? Yes, that's what the passengers reported and the senior flight attendant as well. So uh, the uh, intention is to return to Singapore. All indications are currently normal. Okay, I understand. Uh, can you spell for me, Cowling? C O W L. I S U. Okay, copy that. Let me see if I can pick it up. Uh, do you require any 
Uh, please, Jefferson. Uh, we are not able for that. Uh, that's the reason I would like to uh, enter the holding first. Uh, we are able for over standing, so that's not a problem. But we'd like to enter holding first. Okay, so perfect to fix your understand you require to come back to Changi to land as uh, ASA. ASA, I'm requesting radar access back to Changi Airport, runway 02. Charlie, okay, to fix today. And radar arrival, this is uh, GOCAT 2638. 7,000 speed heading 200. Request a slight delay. Go ahead, 268, therefore arrival on the 02 sector, descend to 4,000 feet. Descend to 4,000 feet for 02 sector, go ahead, 268. Go ahead, 268, uh, request how long duration or delay do you require? About uh, 10 minutes, go ahead, 268. We do have now a Kia unsafe warning, so uh, uh, we cannot continue the island. That's the rate of exit to the one. Heading 060. Uh, Go at 268, say again your request. Request heading 060, we do have an un uh, gear unsafe warning. Okay, Go at uh, 268, uh, just to confirm your error message now on the board is a unsafe uh, warning. Yes, we have to go through the procedures for the landing gear unsafe. Uh, please give us five minutes. We'll try to validate gear extension when I come back to your focus today. Okay, understood, thank you. Mayday, 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 Go Cat 2638. At 4,000 feet on heading 180, we do have a uh, unsafe gear warning. We request it to delay the approach for at least one hour to uh, reduce the weight of the aircraft. EOB is 183. Bring it straight to 9 Victor, single all rail stop. And uh, just to confirm your uh, holding uh, uh, endurance. Let's look at 263, we can hold for three and a half hours. Okay, 263, contact me for departure, what's 20 dash 43? Okay, 2638, what's 203? Okay, when able, could you advise the nature of the immediate? Yeah, first we, uh, the uh, accident call fell off, and uh, during the approach we had a uh, landing gear unsafe warning. We uh, tried the alternate procedure, but uh, the landing gear on the left side is uh, still indicated as unsafe. So we are going through the full procedure. Uh, we are currently burning fuel. Uh, the weight of the aircraft is 69 pounds. The maximum landing weight is 64 pounds. 64,500 kilos. So we need to burn fuel for, we need to continue in the hold for at least an hour. So can you say of the computer reason for the media is because the entry callings are uh, fall off and uh, during the approach. Is it taken? Landing gear on the left. Landing gear on the left. On the left side. The main landing gear on the left side is not down, according to the indication. So can you say we a copy on the first landing gear on the left side is not uh, down according to the indication? It's not okay to fix it. We continue the hold and we call you when we are ready for the approach. Uh, the aircraft uh, probably needs to be towed from the runway. Okay, confirm the aircraft needs to be towed when uh, after landed. Hey, uh, and uh, go ahead to six three. Just to check, after landed, you have to be towed. Can you hit uh, the runway on your own power initially? Uh, that's a uh, negative. Go ahead to six three. We just like we need to be towed off the runway. No problem. No problem. Is your hydraulic tank uh, safe? Uh, stand by. Go ahead to six three. Departure say again for GoCat 268. GoCat 268, check if your hydraulic tank is safe. Departure GoCat 268, the uh, hydraulic indications are normal. Confirm your hydraulic indication is normal. Hey, somebody, they are normal. GoCat 268. GoCat 268 from the uh, airport emergency services. They would like to know if you are confident to make the landing. Look at the six uh, We are able for landing. However, we do have a landing gear unsafe warning on the left main gear. Look at the six uh, Understand uh, the left main gear. There's an unsafe warning. But however, the, uh, the officer from the uh, airport emergency would like to know whether you are confident to make the landing. Hey, sir. We declared a May Day about one hour ago. So I do expect the equipment on standby, all of the equipment. Okay, 
Very interesting, quite different to the first case study. Um, just going to ask here, Anya, and I'll follow up with Sebastian. How effective would you say that communication is, Anya? From a pilot's point of view, I see it uh, very ineffective again, very similar to the, the first case. Uh, we just see ADC as a, a big distraction in, in both cases. So I, I imagine myself in that situation, there's a lot going on. Um, mm -hmm. The situation, at the, the landing gear unsafe, it's quite a complex situation. So we might get information from our company uh, or from Airbus, you know, which at that point in time is a lot more important than all these questions being asked by ATC. Um, going back for, for pilots, it's aviate, navigate, communicate. So communication is number three on the list for us. And it seems so much time is wasted on, on clarifying things like what, what is there a problem with the hydraulic? Just confirm what the problem is, etc. But it we seem to lose purpose of, of the conversation. It's an emergency call. Uh, so Lance has touched on this before, the dynamic has changed. We need to help the pilot, we need to help the aircraft get on the ground safely. Um, I think Alicia, the example that she gave before was, was great. That was a day-to-day -day, uh, conversation where it is very important that we understand clearances on day-to-day -day normal communication. Um, it needs to be accurate. Sometimes we go as far as using pneumatics to, to, you know, to do the spelling, etc., to make sure that we understand each other. But in an emergency call, I think the focus should be on assisting the pilot. So asking what they need, listening to them. It's not important that ATC really understands uh, what the technical issue is or which gear seems to have an indication, et cetera, et cetera. So mm -hmm. I think that um, from this webinar, we need to start distinguishing between the purpose of, of the call. So both situations are emergency calls. So we need to keep focused on what we're trying to achieve here. Okay, so yeah, really interesting. So Sebastian, just, just to pick up on something that Anya mentioned, and as a from the controller's point of view, why do you think the controller's asking all these questions? Uh, clearly, there's a lot more than Anya's comfortable with as a pilot, but why do you think that's happening? Trying to find out as much information as possible uh, to transmit that to the crew on the ground, which is going to be there and help the aircraft once it lands. As well, you you don't have only that single aircraft in your frequency and in your airspace. So there's a lot of things missing from this. I don't know how many aircraft air, that air traffic controller had. I don't know the weather at that certain airport. He requests to hold. Um, depending on the weather and aircraft departing and incoming, I can choose a different holding position for him. Uh, depending on how uh, long he needs to hold, uh, as well. Uh, so, so Sebastian, just sorry to interrupt, but if you were in that controller's position, do you think you would ask the same amount of questions? Uh, not, not at that point. When he first no, comes in, because they're under heavy workload. First, okay. I need, he needs to, or they need to give me the information that there's a problem. I can acknowledge mm -hmm. that problem and I can wait for them to come back and tell me what they need. Because I don't need to push to give that information always. Sometimes the information, what the pilot thinks we need to know, they're gonna give us that information. If we need something uh, more than that, when we are uh, having this exchange of information, that's a good time for me to uh, ask a question. But going, uh, trying to clarify and over clarify and again asking the same question in the same manner three or four times it's wasteful for the time you have on the frequency 
Yeah, okay. I'm just, just curious, is, it, is there anyone in the panel, this is just for anyone, who could offer a reason why that's happening? Why there's so many yeah, questions think, from the caller? I, I think, I think what, uh, what jumped out to me uh, in defense of ATC in this case is that the, the pilot initially, and for quite a, it appears for quite a long period of time, was quite vague. In fact, he didn't declare a mayday for several minutes. Uh, I think his first, uh, his first comment was re request return to Singapore due technical. Now, that can mean a lot of things. And I think the, the air traffic controller was trying to understand uh, the severity of the situation, but for some reason wasn't able to ask the question directly. Um, and I think that was, you know, he was almost trying to prompt it by saying things like, uh, do you need to dump fuel? Uh, and even quite a long way into the conversation or uh, the exchange, um, the, the GOCAT aircraft was, you know, quite relaxed. We request a slight delay. Um, so I, I, I do think that this was very much, as I think Sebastian was just saying, the, the ATC were trying to understand how they needed to prioritize this, um, given the fact that they're not the only aircraft in the sky. So they're trying to they're trying to juggle many balls. They're trying to manage many different things. And where do they put this guy in the sequence? Mm -hmm. okay. All right, thanks. All right, I'll pass to, to one more thing, if I could. Yes, uh, sure, go ahead, Sebastian. When the pilot tells the ATC that uh, his uh, cowling came off, the first reply from ATC is left engine housing came off. Uh, the pilot immediately goes to uh, correct ATC and tell him the cowling. However, the engine housing is a pretty accurate representation of what happened there. I'm really curious what would have happened if the pilot would have said a firm to that uh, uh, mm. to that ATC's question. It would have gone in a different yeah, way. Yeah, good point. Hear back, uh, yeah. read back, and it was and interesting. Read back are important as well. Mm. Yeah, it was interesting that Sebastian that that when he did offer housing, the pilot came back with cowling, and then he he moved on to bowling, which of course is completely mm -hmm. nonsensical. So yeah, interesting. Good point. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to pass to to Neil to keep going. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I think that's that's a, that's a really inter interesting point because th th there's, there seems to be an element of firstly confusion and then sort of understanding of, as to whether it's housing, bowling, cowling, and clearly housing and cowling are two completely different things. Um, I mean, I, I would probably direct this at, at Aline and Alicia as controllers. Why do you think the controller seems to initially suggest he kind of knows what's happening, but then later on it becomes a little bit un unclear? So that he he's he, he almost sounds him himself if he's not 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 too sure, he, even though he's he's had it spelled out for him literally and, and metaphorically. Um, maybe I step in here. Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> Before today, I never knew what cowling was, uh, by the way. It's not one of those words that as controllers we learn. I mean, we control and pilots fly and we have different uh, understanding. So for me as a controller, uh, it's not the cowling itself that is so important, it's the implications. What does it imply? What's gonna happen? But uh, in, uh, in this respect, I have the feeling that the controllers had the airport authorities blowing up in their necks saying we want to know as much as possible because mm -hmm. asking the question are you confident to make a landing I mean this is no go you would never ask such a question to a pilot mm -hmm. on a mayday you know you want him to land you don't want to see any doubt of that which makes me wonder if they had yes the airport authorities or someone of power Beyond the <laughs> beyond the ATC that was um, pushing for more information. Can, can um, I just jump in a little bit there? Right? Yeah. So, like, this idea of asking the pilot is he, it's a very it just strikes me as being a very odd question. You know, are you confident to make the landing? Um, do you think maybe that's been lost in translation between the ground 
and ATC and, and subsequently being passed to the pilots is there a, a, an element of, you know, maybe not quite using the right expression or something there or, you know? Yeah, I don't know. We had a situation uh, a few years ago in Geneva, um, which was a little bit similar in a way. Um, there was a lot of snow and um, I think it was a jersey coming from England going to Lyon and he couldn't land because of snow and the front was coming from the west so Geneva wasn't in the snow yet so they decided to divert to Geneva and Geneva airport authorities refused this guy because they were overloaded and the parking was full it was a chartered day um, and they said we can accept him only if he declares a May Day which the pilot wouldn't do because it wasn't a May Day yet. Uh, and in a way, it's a kind of a juggle situation. And in the end, the controller reported to the airport authorities, yes, it is a May Day, even though it hadn't been declared. And later on, it was a May Day, mm. by the way. But, you know, sometimes as a controller, especially the, uh, the, tower, the tower controller has to juggle with a, a lot of other items, mm. whereas the, the departure or upper controller, you know, they just want to get the aircraft down as soon as possible and be out of it. You know, the sooner you send him to tower, the, you know, the better it is for you because it's, it's no longer your problem. Uh, but uh, the airport authorities are quite, um, quite tough on, on certain occasions. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I agree also with Lance that he said the, the pilots were not very clear. It seemed that they were speaking two parallel messages. One wanted to land as soon as possible and the other wanted delay 10 minutes first. And then they declared a May Day, but they wanted to wait an hour. And as a controller, how do I take this message? For mm. me, a May Day, he wants to land yeah. as soon as possible. I cleared yeah. everyone in front of him. I emptied the runway, everyone diverts. And if it says May Day, I can land in an hour. I don't know what to do with mm. that information. It's, it's an interesting yeah. one because there, yeah, the, the, the pilots are not, they don't seem to be communicated to ATC what, what they're actually presumably discussing between themselves. So there's a bit of a break in the, in the whole communication loop there. Um, and let's hear again from, from an ATC point of view. I mean, how did that strike you? Well, eh, I was wondering the same as Aline. Eh, for me, eh, well, the pilot said my day and you have to treat it like that. But it seems that while they were eh, in flight, it was a pump pump because uh, they they were going to be an hour or so holding uh, to one fuel. Uh, I also think that the pilot was not clear enough, or perhaps he could. Uh, he's proficient uh, in the language, but he didn't accommodate to the uh, air traffic controller, and the air traffic controller was not as clear or concise as he should. Um, perhaps know so many questions and telling the pilot, how can I help you, would have been more useful for this situation. Mm. Um, yeah, I also think that there were too many people asking the, the, the air traffic controller what the pilot was going to do, because as an air traffic controller, we also can declare a May Day or can think that the pilot is in danger and and treat it like a May Day. Mm. Um, so I think there were uh, errors from both parts. Pilot could have paraphrased and the controller could have been more clear and concise. Okay, thanks, Lucy. One last question, and I'll hand you back to Michael for, for a couple more questions. From an ATC point of view, there's, there's always that element of we're trying to help, we want to help, we want as much information as possible. But clearly, as we've said, and, and, and Lance and both Anya have said this as well, that you know, you aviate, navigate, and communicate is the is the final part of that um, process. Um, do you think sometimes there's there's a it's just a natural human reaction from the from the controller who just wants to help? So there maybe there's an element that where they actually perhaps are talking too much. I, mean, I guess it's to, you know, to to the panel as a whole. I wouldn't say so. Okay. Um, as, as a controller, you 
provide safety and you make sure everyone is safe. And then in an emergency or a, a usual situation, you just leave the silence and you just say report intentions when ready. And then you just stay, you leave it mm -hmm. empty. Leave the pilots the silence they need to uh, sort out what they want. If I keep bombarding them with information, how can they tell me what they need? Sure. I think that um, I think it it also comes back to this point of um, uh, the responsibility of the flight crew again to to lead the the situation and to communicate very concisely and very clearly number one the severity of the situation so is it a mayday or isn't it is it a pan call or is it nothing secondly to to um, give a, a reason for the mayday and all you need to say for example is we have an engine problem you don't need to go into detail about the cowling the bowling or whatever else because actually ATC wouldn't be expected to know the technical details of every aircraft that they're dealing with. So you just have to give them a broad picture that you have a very severe situation perhaps, and it's related to your engines or to your electrical system. And that your intention is to sort the problem out and land. Something as simple as that. Um, it's no wonder that ATC will start pushing you uh, for you know, which will distract you um, if you if you haven't given them, them that basic information because they don't know how to help you. Mm, sure, sure, sure. It's okay, interesting. I, I mean, this, this, it's, um, yeah, it's it's quite edited that the 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 script in the audio here. So just to probably explain it. So the first probably the first hour here is the pilots are really just contending with the the engine cowling, and later after they've burnt fuel and you know, been holding for quite a long time, an hour, I think it was. Um, then they declare the mayday. That's really just to do with the, the gear unsafe indication. So they've lost confidence that they, or not confident that they can, you know, that the, all three of the landing gear are down. I think that's part of the issue. But let me, let me just ask a question maybe to Gabriel, because Gabriel flies uh, in Chinese airspace. And of course, as a Brazilian, he's, he's talking to um, controllers in, uh, Chinese controllers, very different culture. I'm, I'm just going to ask Gabriel, do you think cultural issues played a role here in the communication? Yes, of course. Uh, uh, for me here, I think I could expect the same situation of this captain. He was a German captain, right? Flying with a local first officer and flying in Singapore. For me, it would be the same situation. I was flying with a Chinese first officer in a Chinese airspace. And the cultural thing is really important. You really need to understand and know how are the procedures in China, for example. Here we are need to fly in meters. It's a big issue. We are not used to flying meters. And then in the case of this emergency situation, for sure, I will be honest with you guys, for sure, I could not speak with the Chinese in English. The first officer will do the communication in Chinese and translate to me what he was talking about with the controller. The English we could forget in this kind of situation in China. It's impossible. Wow, really? So, yeah. I mean, obviously the, when there's a time constraint there, Gabriel, do you, do you feel safe? Do you feel comfortable as a, as a captain in the flight deck? Now I feel, I feel confident here after four years flying, but in the beginning it's really challenging, you know, because you can see on this, in these small details here, even if you have a bad weather, just a simple situation, you cannot speak in English with the Chinese anymore. The first officer starts talking about, with, they start talking with the controllers in Chinese and then translating to, hey, captain, the, the controller said that to us, let's do the heading x for example so mm -hmm. now i feel confident here but in the beginning is really challenging because you can feel in an emergency situation you cannot communicate with the controller here yeah so i mean just personally i mean you've got a lot of experience in brazil of course as well how does that make you feel not having that direct relationship with atc is that something that you feel 
it's sometimes a difficult. Yeah, it's not a good situation, right? It's not it's not easy. It is. It's not a good yeah. good situation for because I was used to fly in Brazil in my country or in Argentina. I flew a lot with Asia. It's easy to communicate there. I I mm. feel more really more confident. When you come to China, you feel you are in a different country, a different world. The culture is totally different. The systems of flying is totally different here. You are flying with first officers that they are not so experienced. They cannot, they don't have a really good English. If you have some conversation outside of standard phraseology, you're going to have problems. So in, kind of, in, in this situation, for example, an emergency, you have a really high workload. And here, besides the high workload, you also have to deal with this situation that you cannot have a good conversation with the controller specifically in English. Yeah, understand, sure, interesting. Um, just, just going on to this, I mean, the main, the main bit we picked up at the beginning of here is, is that communication about cowling. Now you remember that the pilot, and I'm gonna maybe ask Aileen this one, that the pilot spelt the word cowling. And of course, that didn't seem to get the message across to the controller. Do you think that's an effective a strategy in this case of spelling the word out? Well, using the uh, Charlie, uh, Oscar and so on, uh, yes. But uh, it, in this case, it didn't really seem to work because there were, I think, three different attempts at understanding the cowling. So the controller was asking about it, but wasn't ready to actually write it down somehow. Or mm. I don't know, maybe when they were in a stripless environment and they didn't have a pen, could that be? Yeah, um, it could be. You know, it could be. But whatever it is, uh, someone mentioned, just say, I've got an engine failure, and then I understand. You know, if mm -hmm. you tell me cowling, is it to do with engine? Is it to do with body? Is it to do with uh, pressure? I have no idea. Absolutely no okay. idea. So it doesn't really matter to me what's, you know, cowling. So just say engine. I think keep it so, simple. Make sure that whoever you've got on the other side of the frequency understands. And then from the voice, we can tell, is it serious or is it not? You know, the pilot can say, we've got a serious engine failure. We need this and that. And you just provide it. Um, okay. it's, it's a bit funny, like insisting on this cowling business. It's like showing mm. off your level of English, probably. Even okay. I don't know huh, what the others think. I think that's Alicia, a, I mean, a point of, uh, just just to, to to take that point, Alina. I mean, um, if if the 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 other person is not of that same state of mind, there has to be some kind of negotiation to try and to find out more information. Um, so. You know, I think the assumption is that you know, on, on a level playing field, everybody has that, you know, awareness. But clearly, as we've seen in these two examples, which are, are why they're good examples, that level of awareness is not always there. So, how could that actually be improved to help the situation? You know, that you just talked about there. Is yeah, it maybe, maybe. Sorry. Just, just, I'm going to maybe put this to Anya because it's, it's touching both on what Aileen said and Neil just then. If, if you are the f pilot, Anya, in that situation and you know the engine cowling's fallen off and the controller's insisting on knowing what it is and spelling the word isn't working, would you, is there a strategy you might use to try to convey the meaning? I think go back to to the importance what we're trying to achieve here. It's the safety of the aircraft. So just uh, I think Lance mentioned that as well is use very simple phraseology. So mm -hmm. what your problem is, what your intentions are, and what you need. So it's Sorry, sure, but if if the if the controller in this case is really hell bent, really insisting on on knowing what's fallen off the aircraft or what what the problem is. And he seems to, for whatever reason, maybe he hasn't got a pen or he hasn't got a dictionary or, or whatever it is, he doesn't know what cowling means. Is there any strategy, if you were flying, perhaps into Singapore and this happened, what would you do? Is there any, any technique you might use? Well, assuming that I, I don't understand why it's so important to them, but I would explain in slightly different, in very basic terms, what, what cowling is. 
just say it's part of the engine has come off and how okay. it possibly affect us. It can cut the hydraulic lines, it might affect the gear. So for that reason, we are coming back. So probably okay. Okay. what what the meaning cowling is in, in words. Sure, sure. Yeah, I got to understand. Okay. So it's sort of the accommodation skills, if you like, from maybe from the pilot were maybe even missing there. Something that uh, I think Alicia was talking about earlier. Okay. Thanks, Andy. That All kind right. of answers my question there because there may be that just that, that necessity to, to actually to find out more information. So there has to be, as Michael says, some kind of simplification or as you mentioned as Lance said just keep it very very simple but explain what the situation is in simple terms. Mm. Just on that that point if you remember at the beginning we had that uh, that slide showing if you like a flower with some some petals and one of them there one of the the petals was uh, operational knowledge shared operational knowledge and procedures was another one so if we think about particularly local procedures and maybe the use of jargon. Lance, if you remember, it, right at the end, the, the pilot said, we do expect equipment on standby for our arrival. Now, my, my listening to that, mm -hmm. I'm assuming that the pilot means uh, emergency services uh, parked on the runway with fire trucks and all those things. Now, it was interesting that the, the controller responded and said, yeah, we've got the engineers ready to look with binoculars, presumably, to see if the landing gear is, is down and, and safe. That use of equipment is, is kind of maybe even procedural jargon. What's, what's your take on that? What's your feeling towards the use of yeah. jargon? Well, I, I, yeah, quite, I agree with you, actually, because, um, you know, we, we have to use standard phraseology. It, it's, it's so critical, particularly when we're dealing with across cultures and across, um, you know, with, we're, we're, we're in an environment where, people, where English isn't everybody's first language or they don't have a particularly high level of proficiency. So if you say uh, request emergency services available, that should be very clear to everybody. We want fire services, we want medical, we want whatever. When you say equipment, actually, that, it seems that those guys interpreted that as a pair of binoculars to check to see if the landing gear is down. They, they, they put that mental model, model in their mind, which was, I think, very far from what the pilots needed at that point. So, yeah, it's a really good point that, that we should, as far as possible in high workload, stressful situations, use very standard phraseology. Okay, interesting, yeah, thanks. Okay, thanks, Michael. Um, I think we're being pushed for time once again. So um, thanks guys for that. We'll bring in Anna again now, because I think Anna has got a couple of, uh, oh no, actually we've got a couple of questions, I think, Michael, before we hand back to Anna. Um, mm -hmm. Can, and again, this is this to the, to the panel as a whole. Can it, does anybody have any, any specific examples of, of events or, or operational practices that have been uh, influenced by these kind of communication problems or vice versa, where the communication problems themselves have resulted in changes to operational practices? Um, I have two, two things uh, two things in mind. Um, being as um, in Switzerland, we're in the center of Europe and we have, of course, a lot of different cultures and, uh, and styles. I bring in probably the, the, the airline styles and the differences, you know, when you give a clearance to turn, to climb, or to fly waypoints. There are those who fly over and those who fly by, and those that take a minute and a half to start descent, and those that descend with uh, 3,000 feet. So that's, these are things that as a controller is, um, you know, you, one could be very, very surprised if you don't know the style of a specific airline. 
with experience, we get to know all these, uh, these differences, but when there is like a newcomer, some aircraft or some pilots that don't fly very often in our airspace, it could create some quite uh, challenging uh, uh, situations, which I, yeah, I, I thought is, could be worth mentioning. But maybe, I don't know if it fits in your question, but I thought the, the expectation is, is a big problem. We've had situations where we cleared an aircraft, I don't know, flight level 210, and his requested flight level is 410. So what the pilot does, he hears 410 because that's what he wants. Mm -hmm. The controllers, of course, they are always hearing back, but we have a tendency of doing several things at the same time, and it could happen that we get distracted, and we've had quite a serious incident many years ago regarding that. Mm. So that's, I think, is something that one has to be very, very careful about, mm. the expectation and the hear back. Mm. Mm. Has anybody had any of these kind of situations that have directly led to a, a change in procedures where there's been a sort of greater awareness of the different elements of communication, such as Aline's, you know, just mentioned, strategies for dealing with, you know, multicultural airspace, if you like. I don't know if there's been a change in procedure. However, we had a lot of aircraft with similar call signs during the morning rush, so they were all flying westbound. And we tried to uh, reach out to the companies. The, the call signs were the same every day, the aircraft entering their space more or less at the same time. Sometimes it created confusion. Uh, we tried to reach out to the companies and tell them, could you try and not make the same call signs so similar each day for, uh, uh, for those aircraft? And it had results. They, uh, they changed some of the call signs that helped us. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure they changed their procedures to accommodate us, but it was an improvement. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Sebastian. Um, Michael, I'll come back to you. Um, I think you've got a question about strategies with communicating in different regions. Yeah, I, I just, I, I, for the whole panel, I mean, it doesn't matter if for controllers or, or pilots, um, do you have any strategies that, that you, you fall back on, that you apply when you know you're dealing with a speaker from a particular airline or a particular culture mm. or a particular company where you know they have different procedures. Do you have any strategies that you might apply? Um, I, sorry. Go ahead, Lance. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I mean, very basic, not rocket science, actually. Clear enunciation. Um, and standard phraseology. Um, try to try to uh, speak at the right pace so that people can understand what I'm saying. And very importantly, um, if there's any gray area, if there's any uncertainty, is to clarify. And clarify again if I'm still not sure. And, and to check the understanding of the other party, to check the understanding of the controller, if I think he hasn't understood me correctly, that's also very important. Um, and uh, as somebody mentioned earlier, experience flying in the region that you're flying is, is, is really helpful. But regardless of that, um, I, I try to anticipate potential outcomes, particularly if I'm flying into airspace that I'm not especially familiar with. I'll, I'll familiarize myself with the waypoints as best I can um, and, and the different options for arrivals and departures so that it doesn't come as a complete surprise to me when I get something unexpected. So at least I've got a, you know, that helps my situational awareness to some degree. So just basic stuff, really. Okay, thanks. thanks. What about one of the controllers? I heard this during my ATPL training and also during my ATC training in regard to communication. Keep, keep it short and simple. Don't use big words and try to show off your English level. The shorter and the simple is, in most cases, most effective. And when you see the pilot isn't understanding you, 
don't try to repeat the same words over and over and over again because they're not un gonna understand it the second time either. Try to use different words, maybe simpler, maybe even shorter. Okay, thanks, interesting. I, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> thanks, Sebastian. <laughs> I mean, it's a really key point that Sebastian, I mean, the fact that just, and this is the, the okay. Oh, Seems to have lost so, you now. So having other right strategies, now. awareness strategies, and you know, obviously paraphrasing. So, um, you know, I think really, really uh, important there. Okay, um, thanks guys for the moment. I think we, we go back to Anna now, just to, to bring in some, some final questions for, I think for Michael and myself, and 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 also for the for the panel themselves, to um, to, to contribute as well. So, um, Anna. Yes. yes. Uh, before the the final questions, there is uh, an interesting comment here. Actually, a question for you guys. Uh, there are some comments that I'm going to summarize just uh, as a quick wrap from the, from the audience, right? But a question is, what is the correct phraseology to say, I heard you, but I don't understand, and please clarify without just saying again? Yeah, that's a really mm -hmm. good question. What is the correct uh, phraseology for well, that? Well, that's a really good question because, I mean, this is... The, the phraseology that we're, we're all, all the pilots and controllers are using and that as teachers we're using in... in language classes for pilots and controllers is say again. But if you go back 50 years ago, when the airspace was dominated by native speakers, native English speakers, of course, say again was designed to, to say, repeat a message, perhaps because the, the message was distorted or the radio frequency wasn't clear. And these days, of course, far more uh, second language users of English are flying and, and controlling airspace. And we're still using that term, um, say again. So it's, it's sort of, as Sebastian just mentioned a minute ago, it doesn't really serve the purpose. At the moment, there isn't a, the, any phraseology to, to suggest the meaning there. Um, what, what I think we need to do, if we were really ambitious with moving ahead with in the future, is introduce some phraseology. And in fact, here in, um, in Thailand with the controllers I work with, I, I promote the idea of saying rephrase, request you rephrase. So rephrase is just as Sebastian said, is, is paraphrasing using simpler words, maybe even simpler grammar to get the message across. So to answer that question, there is no existing phraseology, but maybe there's, there's a time for it to be, to be updated and the, and the world's changing and the, the speaker's sharing the airspace are changing and their mm. needs are changing. What and do you I think, think, Neil? I, I think maybe with that, I, I like the idea, but I think maybe with that has to come a kind of a, a an understanding from both sides on what that actually means and how to do it and developing those strategic skills, skills. In, yeah. in, in actually rephrasing. Because the example yeah, I was about, I think when we mentioned last week was um, an example from a, from a student I had in Geneva uh, where a, a native speaker from a native speaker airline um, said something to the tower controller and he said, say again, he repeated it verbatim. And then he said, say again, I'm sorry, I don't understand. And all he did was he just changed the order of the words in the sentence. So even though saying, I don't understand, <laughs> which was fairly clear because I heard the recording, um, it didn't have the effect. So I think in, it is part of this idea of, of, of extending communicative skills, um, this is what could be built into it. So what does that actually mean? And how does the other person actually do it? And, and I'll add to that, how do you recognize, Neil, how does the other speaker recognize there's a need for that? So it's quite a complex issue. And that's about, I mean, that brings in, you know, listening as well. And um, also, you know, the intonation of the speaker, the intonation of the speaker may actually not give the, um, the the meaning that was intended or it might be misinterpreted by the listener. So again, there's all, there's all levels of, of, of misinterpretation, miscommunication. But, but I also like what Sebastian said in the sense that, you know, and, and Lance you know, said this as well, which I'm sure we all agree with anyway, keeping it short and simple, you know, that not being too, um, you know, not saying too many words. Mm. Couldn't agree more. And not yep. being frightened to, to ask, you know. Um, mm. but, but again, I think this needs to be built into 
a, a wider appreciation of, of, of the communication skills and, and that language itself is not just the only answer. There's a lot more to it than that, as, as we've discussed this afternoon. And perhaps even cultural elements, particularly in this part of the world where um, showing you don't understand something could be frowned on. So maybe we've got to also encourage the, the, the notion that showing you don't understand is more important than staying quiet or pretending you understand because of po possible implications later. Mm -hmm. So yeah, training to encourage, um, not necessarily language proficiency here, but to, to build the bridges to facilitate the communication. Oh, certainly, yeah. I mean, I think the, the idea of language teaching, I think all, almost feels a little bit outdated in the sense that everything we've talked about this afternoon is, is part of the, 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 the flower that, that, that you showed earlier on. Um, and, and build that into, you know, the, the, the communication of, of which, of course, language is still a huge part, but build all that in together rather than just having, you know, isolated elements. You know, this Absolutely. is petal one, this is petal two, but bringing it all together and having that awareness of, um, you know, speaking and listening. Listening is not just hearing to somebody speak. It's about understanding and perception and expectations we've talked about there this afternoon. Yeah. Okay, back to Anna, I think. Mm. All right, okay. We have some very interesting comments here on the chat box, but we won't be able to go through all of them. But just some key words that appeared here uh, were, for example, anticipation, prioritizing, paraphrasing, and good interacting skills, checking, confirming, clarifying. Also standard phraseology in emergencies and keep simple and that sort of things, right? So some strategies, some, some things that pilots and controllers uh, should use in terms of strategies as well. But uh, again, I, uh, we won't be able to address all, all the comments, okay? And now, um, so what would be the implications of all these that we discussed in this webinar for training? So what lessons could we take out from these uh, examples to improve pilot ADC communication practices? Yeah, I, I think maybe just to start off, um, th there's certainly room, as, as Neil just mentioned a minute ago, there's certainly room to broaden the sense of what aviation English teaching is. It's not just this isolated notion of pronunciation, grammar, vocabulary, maybe even just listening, that we need to expand this to take account of uh, operational knowledge, uh, those things in the flower, of course, the, the assumptions that could people bring to the conversation, to the interaction, uh, the, the technical knowledge that maybe one party has, is not maybe aware of that the other has, a combat, the strategic skills, accommodation, build those into to training, not just for, obviously for, non-native English speakers, but also the native speakers. How do we, how do we get native speakers um, to, to be aware that perhaps that some of the people they're talking to may not be as familiar with the language they're using, recognize that and develop strategies through training that help their, their colleagues on the radio understand them better for, for all sorts of efficiency and safety reasons. I think just to, to, to expand that even further from what Michael's just said, I think the need to bring in operational experts, as we've got here this afternoon, with language experts working on this whole situation of communication together um, and, and building that understanding and awareness together of what's actually happening and how we can all improve that communication through language, through understanding, through perception, through awareness um, and all the different elements. I think. I'd like to, you know, just very quickly to, if, to, to, to finish off with anybody from the panel that's got any, uh, anything to add to what Michael and I have just said there, because I think it's, it's really interesting. and I think it's important that that's a direction we, we need to be looking at. Well, um, I, I think understanding the, the, the environment that, that the other party is in is quite important and uh, Four or five years ago, I, I did a very interesting trip to Hong Kong Air Traffic Control Center, and they gave us uh, 
an hour presentation on on their operating practice, um, and then took us into the uh, into the control room. Uh, let us talk to the controllers and let us watch them working. And you know that was invaluable, I think. And um, you know if controllers could understand the other side, if they could come to flight simulators with us from time to time, I think that would provide great benefits as far as communication is concerned. Yeah, and I think just, just going back to something that Neil mentioned is this, this idea of the training, the need for training, as these sort of pictures suggest, is not just treating it as a language class or a communications class in isolation, is sort of if we can in the future link language training, communications training, into embedded into sort of human factors training where it's immersed throughout all the refresher training and maybe even OJT on the job training for ab initio pilots and controllers right from the beginning, not something that sits outside the, the main thrust of their operations training. I think that would mm -hmm. be something that would be beneficial, yeah. I was just going to say that, Michael, um, having been involved in CRM, TRM training for several years and seeing, you know, lots of sessions where pilots and controllers were sitting in the same room for one, sometimes two days, uh, just discussing issues about procedures and uh, language and misunderstandings. And it, it is an invaluable thing because you you get to understand why the other party is behaving in a certain mm -hmm. way. And, um, and you can actually ask questions to understand things better. I think this is, this is really the, the, one of the key issues to, to go through. And starting from, you know, from case studies like we've looked at and understanding what are the pros and cons and why did we behave like this and why did you do that? And that could really be a, a good step forward. Yeah, I think that's really good. I think those pictures that we see there is a really nice mix of operational situations, simulated training, classroom training, this theory and this practice. And I think that's quite a nice it, it, it gives a nice overview of, I think, you know, where we're actually looking at in terms of the environment that we're working in, because it's communication in very, very, very um, specific situations. All right, and, and what would be the implications for aviation English teaching that we currently have, that nowadays we see uh, in, in, um, in current practices? What, what would need to change in just a few words? From, from my point of view, a broader awareness. I mean, everything we've talked about this afternoon um, goes way beyond just language and isolation. And I think most people would recognize that just having a language doesn't mean you can communicate. So I think all those other elements of, um, of, of communication are really, really important. Um, how we build that into to language training, communication training programs, I think needs to be looked at. I think in terms of having official recognition for language and communication training based on a, on a particular training syllabus, um, not just a, a teaching certificate, bringing on board pilots and controllers with language people as well, looking at communication. And, you know, as, as Lance mentioned before, sharing those experiences and, and as you mentioned there as well, I mean, sharing those experiences between the different groups of people. So everybody's much more aware, uh, as, as I think a lot of us have been this afternoon, of the kind of challenges that are there in terms of the communicative process. Yeah, and I, I'd, I'd add to that, Anna, um, as a starting point, perhaps, is going through, as we did uh, here tonight or, or today, case studies with, with mixed groups where there's time available to to highlight these differences and increase awareness that wow this this pilot is is talking about an engine cowling for example that's that's come off and the, the controller doesn't seem to be able to express that he he doesn't know what that is or maybe he does but it, it's not coming across very well and it's causing a lot of uh, strain on the on the conversation even playing those sort of case studies 
um, to operational people to get them to reflect on how that could impact on their, their behavior and, the, and how they communicate on the job and then build into that for CRM, TRM, human factors training and communications training. I think it would, it's a long process, yeah. But certainly with the starting point there is start to build awareness of, of all these sort of issues, how they can converge into affecting communication. All right, good. Would, would any of you in the panel like to add anything or because we are certainly uh, ahead of time, right? <laughs> Okay, so I think we're getting to the end of our webinar, at webinar number six. I would like to thank you so much for joining us today. Thank the panelists for your time, for your contributions, for sharing your experiences with us today, right? And we hope to see you again soon in our uh, next IKEA webinars. So thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks, Anna. And a very big thank you from, from all of us at IKEA to, to the six of you for joining us this afternoon and making this a really enjoyable webinar. And I hope very much for everybody who's been watching us uh, as well. So uh, hopefully we'll, we'll see you again very soon. But thanks very much for, for taking the time out to, to be with us today. And thanks to Anna as well for running the show. Thank yeah, you. thanks. <laughs> thank you, everybody. And, and just a message out there to the pilots and the controllers. Who, who may be participating in this webinar. If you, if you feel these sort of topics are of interest and you would like to participate in something more like this in future webinars, let us know because um, I think this year we're looking to, to incorporate you know, more, more of the pilots and the controllers in the discussion uh, as, and think about more of the communication issues. Of course, we're still looking at language training and, and testing issues, but expanding this to, to look at the operational side, the different points of view, and, and draw on all the members here to participate. Um, and I think we'll see in future webinars this year, we're going to explore this issue a little bit more about communications, culture, um, knowledge, shared knowledge, uh, and how those impact on the training and the communication. We'll, we'll, we'll get onto that as we, as we get through the year. So, yeah, the message is anyone out there who's got things you'd like to say, like to contribute, let, let us know at IKEA and it'd be good to have you on a panel in the future. Thanks. This, this uh, webinar will be recorded, uh, well, has been recorded. Not all of it, uh, the little, the first few minutes didn't quite get through, but it'll be available hopefully within a week or so um, for those who joined a bit late or have colleagues who are interested. And maybe we can, we can copy some of the chats, some of the comments in the chat, maybe just put those up there as well for uh, to keep, yeah. the, keep the thought process going as well. Because there's quite a lot of interesting sure. comments that have come through on the chat as well. Absolutely. We can preserve the chat as well, sure. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Okay, thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye -bye. Take thank care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. Bye, everyone. Happy New Year. Thanks, guys. Thanks to you. Stay safe. Thank you. Happy New Year, Gall. Bye everyone, thank you very much.